Growing oysters is the only job I've ever done. And my dad started the business when I was about five or six. And I used to work with him. Well, I used to go out in the boat with him. Probably didn't do too much work when I was little. And worked through primary school, secondary school. Um, got away to college for a couple of years, which was great. And then came back and I've been working full time ever since. My name is Kean Louette Pfizer from a business called Carnac Oyster Company. And uh, we grow oysters. The tide is just starting to move and you can see the oyster bed is just coming out of the water behind us and you can see the lovely vista of the Moor Mountains as well. There's about a dozen of us here working on the oyster farm. Half of us are involved in the growing part of the farm and the other half are involved in all the packing and washing and uh, the dispatch. We're very focused on the quality of our oysters. As are, like many, if you, there are some fantastic oysters around the UK and Ireland. Oyster farmers get a little bit too attached to their oysters. They put far too much work into them because they're there for three years. And it's very, very satisfying when you see a crop of oysters and you've done all the right things at the right time over three years and they just come perfect off your farm. It's like, it's nice to get paid, but it's really almost as rewarding just to see beautiful oysters coming off your farm. It takes us three years to grow our oysters. Uh, when we buy them first, they're about the size of your little fingernail and they're about a tenth of a gram. After the first year, they're about 10 grams on average. After the second year, about 30 grams. And then the final year, they come up to 60 or 70 grams ready for sale. So we have stuff here that we just bought. This is springtime now in the autumn. And uh, so these, 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 these seed oysters are literally only here for six months. Um, and most of it was the winter where they haven't grown too much. But you can see already, there's quite a variation in size. So we've got like loads of different sizes there. So we're just running it through the water grader here. And uh, there's four different meshes on there under the water. And it just saves the oysters into four different grades for us. And it just makes the growth more uniform for the next cycle. Uh, again, we have about 60,000 bags on the farm and every bag is graded once a year. So it takes three years to grow, but each year we grade them once. So this first uh, conveyor here is taking out the smallest grade. I'll get a handful of them. So really they're just stuff that hasn't really grown at all. So you get a huge variation in growth in the oysters and some of the very little growth, a few dead shells there, and uh, the other stuff will maybe 10 times the size of that. So. That's the smallest grade. And if you come through here, I'll show you the next one. Behind you there, you can see the second smallest grade. This is one of the middle-sized grades here. And then... That's kind of the biggest one there. So you can see the variation that we're getting fairly quickly. So. If we don't grade the oysters, the quality really drops away. So it's kind of one of the things you have to do to get better quality oysters. It's just continuously grading the oysters, keep them the same size roughly in the bags, and they grow more uniform, you get a nice shape. If you have lots of different sizes in the bags, the shape tends to be a bit long and thin and the quality drops away. When my dad retired, we used to just sell all our oysters bulk out to big wholesalers in France and they would buy oysters from Ireland and other places and pack them and sell them on. And there was something in my head that I wanted to sell our own oysters under our own name. And it was quite an uphill struggle to start because I remember, you know, often people at Carlingford Oyster, nobody heard of a Carlingford Oyster. There'd been oysters in Carlingford a hundred years ago. Um, and longer, but they'd all been fished out. So there was a gap of time where there was no knowledge of a carnic oyster. Um, but it was just persistence and trying to look after customers and eventually people now can kind of recognize our oysters when they see them on a the menu, which is fantastic. This guy over here, he's very shy, but we're gonna try and get a few words out of him. It's my dad, he's 83, and he retired about 20 years ago, and then he got bored. So he took on a couple of hundred bags of oysters. So he's got a little kind of pet oyster farm and uh, just keeps him busy, keeps him out of trouble. But he started the farm in the 70s, so 40 odd years ago. So it's all, it's all his idea. So come on and we'll see if we can talk to him. Hey, Dad. Yeah. How's it going? Fine. Can I get a picture of you? I'm in a rush. I know you are, but you can work and talk. I'll help you. I'll help you. So, 
So this is my father, Peter, who started the oyster farm. It's all his idea. And uh, this is his little tractor and his little trailer. And uh, where his trestles are, it's very deep and you can't drive with the tractor. So he unhitches the trailer and it floats. As you can see, the surfboards here give it a bit more stability. I'll do a bit of work, so learn to keep. And uh, he'll hitch off the trailer and uh, float the boat out to, where, out to where his trestles are. And uh, he's very, very passionate about the way he looks after his oysters. You know, he looks after his oysters better than he looks after his children. Who do that? They, they don't. Children don't need any look at. So there, so you can see he's got quite a pile of these ones as well. There you go, Dad. So I see these are kind of seed oysters, the same as what we were showing you on our grader today, except Peter's graded these by hand. And you can see the small ones in the small mesh bag and the bigger ones in the bigger mesh bag. And they're all going to have to see. So, and his oysters are much better than ours because he because he looks after them individually next year next year that next year next year no his oysters are fabulous so you know i'm very lucky you see i'm very lucky my children are better than me total madness madness come to me do you want the real story the real story, so my dad's Dutch, he was born in Indonesia because my grandparents were teachers out there and he was out there in the middle of World War II and they came back to Holland and he always interested in sailing. He should be saying all this, he'll tell lies anyway. He's and uh, he's, he's always interested in the sea and sailing. He moved to Ireland and was doing a bit of fishing and things. And uh, it was a radio program on BBC Radio 4 and somebody was talking about growing seed oysters and growing oysters. He says, that sounds interesting, I'll try that. And basically from that, it just grew and grew and grew. When I started uh, marketing our oysters, the Irish market, you would, we wouldn't have been able to sell our oysters in the Irish. It's just too small of a population. And although in the last 10 or 15 years, you can really see an interest in oysters, uh, and, the, and the amount of oysters we sell in Ireland has increased, but. In the, in the 80s and 90s, that just wasn't going to work. Our nearest market was the UK, and we're only 15 minutes from the border. And we literally used to pack the oysters, 100 in a box, and take them up. And we used to go to the post office in Uri, and they used to go on the Red Royal Mail vans and be in London the next day. It was fantastic. Um, so it, it's our biggest market. Um, the Irish market is building up nicely, and we also have some customers in Asia, uh, which is fantastic because I remember the first time somebody from Asia rang was up looking for oysters and I thought it was a joke. I, I nearly dismissed them on the phone and just luckily I kept listening and uh, it's a fantastic experience. They're really into their high quality seafood and it's upped our game because we have to meet their demands and we've learned a lot from working with those customers. These are just the growing bags. So you can see, you know, the bag is probably 80% empty, but when we take them back at the end of the year, there'll be more or less 10 kilos of oysters in this bag, and it'll be completely full. Yeah, they're just the bags for on growing the oysters. These ones here, um, we've got a float on these bags. One of the things we do on the farm is we turn the bags over continuously, and it kind of keeps the shape uniform, um, and it keeps the seaweed clean off the bags as well but it's very labor intensive. So what we've done is we've put a float in the bag and what happens is the, the bag is hanging from the frame like this. And as the tide comes in and out, it'll uh, rotate the bag like that. And it kind of rums the oysters around a bit and you get a really good, high, good quality oyster coming out of that system. So over here is where we pack all our oysters before we uh, send them out to the customers. So after the grading, we put them in the purification tanks and they're in there for two days and then we lift them back out. There's loads of different color boxes you can see, and it's basically all the different sizes. We've got 14 different grades of oysters. We've lots of different colors boxes for different grades. Um, these ones here are our smallest size. They're about 60 grams, about 14 pieces per kilo. And then this is one of our biggest sizes here. Um, they're about 200 grams in size, so nearly three times the size. So different customers in different places looking for different oysters. 
And uh, so we do spray it out different sizes for different customers. The small ones are really nice, actually. They're one of my favorite sizes to eat. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the big ones, but some people love the big ones. So customer's always right. So again, all different colors are all different sizes of oysters, small, medium, and large. Um, so Larissa, Morella, Damien, and Brian are packing all your oysters. So if you ever get a Carnival oyster, they've been put in a box by these guys here. Actually, when we're spoke, talking about packing, um, the shelf life on an oyster is about 10 to 12 days. And the most important thing is for the oysters to be deep shelled down. So if you look at the guys packing, they're not just throwing them into the box. Every single oyster is packed with a deep shell underneath. That keeps the liquid inside the oyster. And like this, they keep for about 10 days. If they're this way around, after two or three days, they dry out and then they start to open and die. So it's really important to have them this way around. What keeps me interested in the oyster farm is we have customers looking for really good quality oysters and it's quite a challenge to grow them. And even after 40 years, it still doesn't work perfectly. Like if we get really good oysters one year and we do exactly the same thing the following year because of different weather conditions or different rainfall, it, you just won't get the same results. Um, so it, it keeps us on our toes. We're still learning. Like we've got, we've had really good oysters one year and then I remember the, a dozen of us sitting in the canteen having a meeting going, what is going on this year? We did just what we did last year and just the quality's not in it. You know, maybe we're a bit stupid. We should have figured it out by now, but we haven't. And in a way, that's a good thing, because it'd be awful boring if we just did the same thing every... Although the job is very monotonous and it's very repetitive, we do the same thing day in, day out. But it's nice, because you get out on the shore for three or four hours every day, and then you're in the factory grading for three or four hours every day, or I'll be in the office for three or four hours. Um, I wouldn't like to be in the office all day either, it just wrecks me. And, and anyway, after three hours, I'm completely unproductive, so I may as well be out on the beach. And there's days like this when it's sunny and it's fabulous to be out there. But even when you go out on a rough day and we could be out in the dark in the winter at four or five o'clock in the evening, you come back in, you get home, the fire's lit, you have a nice big feed in front of you and you just melt into the chair, it's fantastic. This area here in front of us, this is our storage area. So these, uh, these bags and trestles, they're exposed by the tide on every single day. We get a week of spring tides and then a week of neap tides. And the tidal range on a spring tide is about five meters in Carlingford. So if you go into the village, have a look at the pier at low tides, it's about five meters high. Um, on a neap tide, the tidal range is only about two meters. So it doesn't go out as far, it doesn't come in as far. So at low tide, these cages in front of us, the water will, will kind of be maybe a full water at these cages, not as far out in the beach as we can get. So we bring oysters in from the farm on the spring tides and bring extra and leave them there so that we can keep working during the neap tides. And also what we'll do is the three-year-old oysters that are ready for sale, we'll bring them up to this area and leave them here for about six weeks to condition them. And what that does is they're out of the water for about 12 hours a day, as opposed to on the farm, they're only out of the water for maybe an hour a day. And uh, it gets them used to being out of the water. It toughens up the shell, makes the shell more waterproof, and the ductile muscle is stronger. And that's what gives them the shell play. If we were to take oysters straight from the farm, pop them in the tanks, after two or three days, they'll start opening for the customers. But if we leave them here for about six weeks, they harden up, and uh, they, we get 10 or 12 day shell play. No problem at all. So one of the main jobs in the oyster farm is turning the bags over. And we've seen a wee while, one side of the bag is really green with seaweed. And uh, there's three or four guys and their job is just coming in for three hours in the tide turning bags. And it's quite hard to get guys to do that job. And it's really important. So what we've done, you'll see them in the bags up here is there's a float attached to the bag and as the tide rises and falls it gets turned twice a day and we can only turn it by hand maybe once a month so that's 60 times more higher frequency and the oysters you get out of it are fabulous so we're really happy with that but there's a bit of teething problems because there's so many moving parts a lot of wear and tear on the bags normal bag on the oyster farm we could get 30 years out of 10 at least often 20 you know um, these bags here are not lasting as long as that, so we want to kind of reduce that. 
there's Andre and Alan turning the bag, so you can see it's quite strenuous work. And, uh, and see the way they shake the bags on the side? That breaks off of the new shell and uh, kind of keeps the oysters in really in, in good shape. This line of bags that we're picking up here with Josh and Tolly, it's seed from that we bought last autumn. And we put in about a kilo and a half in the bag and it's three kilos now. So we're gonna bring it up to the factory and uh, grade it and try and get it into nine mil bags. It's in the six mil bag now. We'll grade it and put it back in the nine mil bags, about a kilo and a half. And then we'll have to leave it until January of next year or February next year because we can't really touch the seed from about June onwards. So we just put enough in the bag that'll do until the following winter. And that line, there is about 200,000 oysters in that line. And the line behind is empty. That's the stuff we were grading today. We have two more lines. There's a million oysters between these four lines. Three quarters of the farm is empty. There's nothing growing here. If we were to fill this completely with bags, the growth would just slow down and nearly stop because there's too much, too many oysters per square meter. So we have about 25% of the area full with trestles. And we find that's a good balance between um, the amount of food in the water and the density of oysters. And we get a nice growth rate and a nice plump fat oyster. Anybody who's seen rivers and canals around the place, you'll see like in the summertime, it'll go green with algae because the, the water's too rich. There's too much nutrient in the water and uh, it causes a lot of algae to grow and the rivers or lakes will turn green and the, I think it decomposes then and it takes all the oxygen out of the water and you get fish kills and things like that. So you can see now as the population is increasing that the same thing's actually happening in the sea. For years, people thought the sea was kind of immune to human activity because it was so vast. But um, that's not really the case. And one thing that oysters do is they consume all the algae that grows in the water. So if you look at the water in Ireland, it's a lovely green shade. That's all the algae in it. Um, if you try and grow oysters in the Caribbean, it's just not gonna work because the water's see-through and it's, there's no food in the water. Um, we don't have that problem here. So an oyster farm, if there's a lot of nutrient in the water, they will um, restore the balance. And in, there's some places where they have oyster farms and they're not even for consumption, they're just, uh, to clean up the environment. Like there's, there's a thing in New York called the Billion, Billion Oyster Project. And basically they're putting a billion oysters into the sea um, to try and balance the ecosystem. And there's places around some of the cities in Japan, I think, um, where they grow oysters and uh, it's too close to cities so you can't eat the oysters, but it's basically um, restoring the balance of the ecosystem. These two lines here, this is a batch of seed that we bought about three weeks ago. Uh, we buy most of our seed in the autumn and depending on how the performance is, we might get a little bit more in the spring. And we got one batch in the autumn, wasn't so good, so we decided we'd buy another batch. I think there was a million and a half oysters in these two lines and we've split three quarters of them already this week. And there, and see all the lines between us and the end of the farm? That's all those bags split down to a lower density because uh, it's probably about 10,000 oysters in that bag and we split them down to about 700. So I'll just put my hand in here and grab a handful of them. See what I can see. So, that's the oysters there. We put a few winkles in the bags because the winkles eat the seaweed and keep, see the mesh is spotless clean. They just graze on any seaweed before it can grow. Uh, so everything looks nice. It's starting to grow a wee bit, it's nice and uniform. Um, one or two dead oysters in it. You always get a couple of dead oysters in the seed because you know it's been out of the water for two or three days and it was graded before they sent it here. So there, it's, a, it's it, you always get a couple that don't survive. So that's just a dead oyster there. But there's only one or two of them, so that's no problem and the ones that are surviving are all growing nice and uniformly. This one here is really taken off. You can see, see that fingernail of shell around the outside? 
that's all new growth on the oyster. And earlier on, we saw Alan and Andre turning the bags. And what they're doing is when they turn, they give the bag a shake and that breaks off that shell. Because the oyster grows long and it grows deep. And if you, if you turn the bag and shake the shell, break the shell off, you're breaking that length and it encourages the oyster to grow deeper. So it'll grow back deep and shake the bag again, break off the length so you get a nice deep uh, teardrop shaped oyster. So that's what's, that's what's going out on at the, at the farm. These are floating bags that we put out about a year ago. Um, they're ready for sale. Um, but again, they've been in the water nearly 22 or 23 hours a day. So we'll bring them higher up the beach where they're going to be out of the water for 12 hours a day. Leave them there for a month or six weeks. And then we'll grade them and put them in the tanks for sale. And this is kind of the last of last year's batch. And then we'll be starting stuff that we would have put out maybe February or March of this year. The oyster farm is a bit like painting one of those huge big bridges. You start one end, paint the whole lot of it, go back to the beginning, start all over again. It's kind of tough when there's only three or four of you in the tide. If there's five or six years, it gets a lot easier. So it's just, it's just a matter of having enough people on the farm to do the work, you know. Hopefully after your video goes out, Loads of people will go, that's a fantastic way to earn a living. I never realized it, and they'll come and work for us. And it'll be nice and easy here then. So, what I want to do now is just show you how to shuck an oyster, which is how to open an oyster. Um, a lot of people are very nervous about opening oysters. There's a couple of wee knacks that make it really easy. And it's probably the biggest barrier between getting our oysters to customers and people going, oh, I can't open these at home. So this is really good information for you, okay? So just when you, when you get your oysters, ideally they should be all packed with the deep shell underneath. Um, the deep shell is like a little bath, keeps all the liquid inside and they'll keep like this for about two weeks from packing date. If you leave them like this, the water leaks out slowly and after a day or two they look dry out and open up and even when you even if they don't die when you open them they're all dry inside and it's not very appetizing so if you don't if you if they're not in a box like this pre-packed for you when you bring them home put them in a pasta bowl or something like that in the fridge um, to keep the same temperatures dairy so two or three degrees is perfect deep shell down they will actually keep for about a month or longer but there's no real need for that but you should get 10 days no problem out of your oysters okay so opening the oyster there's a deep shell and a flat shell. And on the deep shell, there's kind of a nose, okay? And just underneath that, there's a little space where you can put the oyster knife. So just in here, okay? Don't hold it in your left hand. Put it down on your breadboard. So that if the knife does slip, you're not gonna do any damage. And you just twist the knife over and back, like a screwdriver, until it kind of catches. It goes in about an inch or half an inch or so. So it's like a lollipop, like this. All right, and at that stage, you can pick up the oyster. If you just give that a twist. Oh, there you hear we pop and the oyster opens up. Sometimes there can be a bit of sand or grit there. So just clean the knife first. On one side, the knife's got a sharp edge on it. The oysters attach the shell about halfway down the side here. So insert the knife there and keep the nice, knife nice and high. Twist it and wiggle it down. So just where my thumb is there, you're just rubbing the knife against the top shell. Ideally, when you open an oyster, it should look as if the top shell has just, just as if the top shell has just magically disappeared. You don't want to interfere or mess up the meat too much. So there's a little bit of new shell, just there, okay? A bit there as well. So there's the oyster, and we'll just cut it away from the top shell. See the little dark mark there? And it's full of liquid as well. So that's a good sign when you, when you get your oysters, they've been stored correctly. And then you need to sever it from the bottom shell in the same place as well. I'll just make sure it's loose. And that's it, that's ready to go. You can see there's plenty of seawater and it's, it's called oyster liquor because the oyster's been in, in that water for, could be a couple of days. So 
it's got a, the seawater is a special part of eating the oysters. But if you take the whole lot together, it can overpower the taste of the oyster. So what I would do, would recommend people is sip the water first, especially if you haven't eaten an oyster before, sip the water first and see how that is. And if you, if you think that's grand, then go ahead and eat your first oyster. And if you don't like that, then maybe stop. But at least if you get that over with you, it's kind of start. Um, the next thing is don't swallow the oyster, chew the oyster, because there's so many different flavors in the oyster and you won't get them if you just swallow it back. I think people used to swallow oysters years ago because they were so nervous all the experience, but chew the oyster and there's loads of different flavors that will be unique to an oyster from Carlingford or from Donegal or anywhere else that your oysters come from and you'll, you'll appreciate all those different flavors if you chew your oyster. So I'm gonna do that now. If you want different, uh, different dressings for your oysters, if you had a range of different oysters from different bays, I would recommend just try at least one with nothing on it so you can taste the different flavors. If you put a dressing on them, you won't taste the subtle nuances in the oyster. But um, a squeeze of lemon is lovely on oysters, something simple like that. Drop of Tabasco. Some people think Tabasco is you know, too strong, but actually whatever parts of your tongue taste Tabasco, it's different from the oyster and you can taste the oyster straight through the Tabasco and it's a lovely combination. Um, Another recipe that's nice is if you can make a mignonette, shallots and vinegar and sugar. And that's really nice for oysters. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch our video today. And uh, if you're ever in the vicinity of Carlingford, please come and visit us in the factory. We're building a new uh, visitor's experience where we can shuck a few oysters for you, pair them with a nice wine. If the tide's out, we can bring you on a tour of the oyster farm and you can see in person how the oysters are grown. Um, if you're traveling anywhere, if you see our oysters on the menu, please try them. At least you'll know a bit more about the oysters that you're eating. And uh, hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much.